day was um, the first day of school for my twins. So they were starting um, like a nursery school in the same school building where Kimberly went. She was in third grade and uh, we had already taken her to school and um, Robert was home. We would be doing our kitchen. So the, all the guys from the firehouse were going to come over and redo the floor and he freed up the whole day. So I got the kids ready and we were sitting outside waiting for, um, you know, like to, to leave to go take them to school basically. And, uh, the, uh, he never, we, usually in the mornings, our children were, you know, consumed with Nickelodeon TV, you know, like the, the TV would always be on Nickelodeon. But I guess since he took, uh, he, he took the opportunity to turn on the news, Fox News, to see the opening bell of the market or whatever. And I was sitting outside on the stoop with the kids. They were, had their little gym suits on and they were ready to go to school. And it was so beautiful out to so outside. And she was, like I said, she was already gone to school. And uh, he, uh, he came outside and he said, a plane hit the World Trade Center. I said, really? And we went, I went inside. And like I said, normally we would never have the news on. And um, we, we were watching. I've been working at St. Vincent's Hospital right before that. I had just quit my job there. And I worked in public relations. And part of the, the history of St. Vincent's is they took in um, patients from a plane crash that hit the Empire State Building, I think in the 30s or something. So I said, you know, it was probably a small plane crash. It happened to the Empire State Building. And we were watching it and the kids were outside. So we had to go back outside. And he was still getting ready for the guys from the firehouse to come. And uh, my neighbor came walking by and was like, you better not, you better be careful going, you know, on the trains. They're going to shut down the trains under the Trade Center, you know, like normal New York things, you know. Like, you'd be like, oh, the trains are going to be screwed up. There's a fire. And, you know, basically, in the beginning, it was just like, you were just thinking it was a fire and an accident. And um, so probably about 15 minutes later, he came out and he said, I know the plane just hit. I have, to, I'm going to have to go. No, probably before that, he had said to me, maybe I should go in now, because he was doing that evening and he was covering on uh, 37th Street in Manhattan. And I said, you know what, why don't you wait? Let's take the kids to school because they're gonna be tired. You know, they're gonna need relief. If everybody goes in now, you know, being the, the wife of a fireman and a child of a fireman, I'm, just, I'm giving him advice of what to do. And um, I said, why don't we wait and, you know, and see what happens. And then you go in after we take the boys to school. And that probably basically probably saved his life because if he would have left it, you know, earlier, he probably would have got there in time for the buildings to collapse. But he waited and, uh, and then it came across the bottom of the screen, you know, all New York City firemen and cops to report to duty now. So he went upstairs. I vividly remember him going upstairs. And uh, I'm like, what am I going to do with these kids? And then what am I going to do with her? She's in school. And... Uh, so I'm just sitting there, like, I just remember just sitting there, like, what the hell do you do? You know, like, he's leaving, and, and uh, I'm sitting in a living room with, like, I have four small children, no kitchen, uh, no floors, <laughs> as a tiny itty-bitty house, you know, like, and um, three-year-old twins, a uh, one-year-old, and, a, and, a, and a an eight-year-old, so... Like, oh God, the floors aren't going to get done. You're still, still thinking on the fact that there's a fire, you know, it, now it's gotten a little worse, but it's still not the catastrophe that it was, you know? And um, he leaves. I said, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to walk up to Flatbush and um, I'm going to find a way to get there from Flatbush. So he left and um, we lived at Marine Park at the time, which is full of firemen and cops. It's running joke that if your house goes on fire, there'll be 10 firemen out there with a garden hose to put it out. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's basically a lot of firemen, cops, teachers. So on his, on his way up, he was walking up, he met up with several of the firemen and they com comedy at a bus. They took gear from a firehouse and then they comedy at a bus and they went over the bridge. So I'm left at the house with the three small children and, um, I don't know what to do. I'm like, what do we do? Like, do I go get her? Do I, 
and or, you know, uh, at the time we, we don't know if it's a ter- we know it's a terrorist attack, but we don't know are we safe and 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 like do I go get her? Do I not go get her? Um, you know, and and I see a lot of my neighbors are going to get their kids, and I'm like, you know, I'm not going to go get her. I don't want her to think that being in school is not safe. You know, I want her to think that she's safe in her school. If I go get her, you know, th- then she's not going to ever feel safe there. And uh, so I waited and they, and I called the school and they said, no, no, they're fine. We, you know, they're, they're in the classroom. They don't know what's going on, but we're not going to start the nursery school today. So now we see what we see is smoke. Like we're now where, if you look at a map, you could, we're nowhere near like the world trade center. I mean, we're in South Brooklyn, but the smoke is, coming down at Smitty Park and like gagging from the smoke and this paper is falling all over the street and like prospectuses, you know, financial papers with burnt edges and like, oh my God, like, you know, you just, you, you just walking around horrified, you know, and you, you don't know what, you, you know, you don't know what to think. And I'm still not worried about him because I guess growing up as a child of a fireman, you don't worry as much as crazy as it sounds because that was what your dad did so then you went to work every day now your husband does it it's you're less worried so um i got in the car and i drove to get her i said i'm gonna go get her and um and they uh as i'm driving past the actual marine park 1010 wind says that um the first tower fell and I, 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 having worked in number one for so many years, I, for Dean Witter, I was like, I, I just couldn't believe that that had happened. So I got to her school and they brought her out and she looked at me and she said, mommy, do I have head lice too? And I was like, what do you mean, Kim? What are you talking about? And in her mind, she, the kids were all being taken out of the classroom because they had head lice. Because, you know, like, usually that's what they do. Like, kids get removed and they just don't come back. So she thought they were all being quarantined because at that point when I went and got her, there was hardly anybody left and I didn't even realize. She was left, like, in a classroom with, like, very little children. And um, we got home and got in the car and by the time I'm passing the park again, the second tower had just fell. So literally in front of the same spot, both buildings fell. And I'll never forget where I was in front of the, in front of the actual Marine Park. So now in my mind, I'm saying, okay, it's now, he left here uh, an hour and, I don't know, it was an hour and 10 minutes ago from the first to the second tower falling. If it was midnight and he was in a Corvette, there's no way he would make it to the World Trade Center from here. In, under normal circumstances, you know what I mean? So I'm um, in my mind, I knew he was safe. I just had to feel like that. I was like, he's safe, he's fine. He's, he didn't make it there in time. He, he, there's no way he was there yet. But you, and I had no cell phone. He didn't have a cell phone. There was no way to call him. So now I'm home, we're all sitting outside and, and um, you know, people are, you know, you gotta remember where we lived is all firemen, cops, people who work there, everybody's outside people crying, you know, children running around and playing because they don't know what's going on. And, um, and just pure disbelief and, and um, panic, uh, worry about family members and my brother, my sister, everybody knows a fireman, everybody knows a cop, everybody knows somebody works in a building. And um, the papers are still coming down. They're still raining on, on Marine Park and the kids are picking them up and bringing them over to us. In fact, I still have a folder of them I had saved. And um, finally at three o'clock in the afternoon, I had my cordless phone outside. My phone rings and it's my mother-in-law. Now my mother-in-law lived 130 miles north of us. And she's like, is Robert working? And I was like, he was home. And she just, she couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't leave her desk. It was, it was horrible. So, um, 
I reassured her that he was fine and uh, he was going to be okay. And uh, because she couldn't leave her desk until she heard. So um, because you couldn't get through, no one could get through on the phones. And uh, and uh, it was so the kids, the kids were playing. Like I said, we stayed outside all day. I don't think we went inside because there was nowhere to go because I had no kitchen. Like I had no like nothing. And uh, and 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 I had and and I did not have a kitchen until like December because when you hire a fireman to do a job, like you know, it was, they were not coming back because they were going to be at the trade center for for months. You know, like looking for their brothers. They they were not coming back to my house. So um, finally, I'd say around four. I I don't know when number seven went down, but seven had just fell. And uh, he found his way to the postal building that's right there. And he got picked up a phone, he called me. And he said, I just want to let you know I'm okay. And I said, I knew you were. I just knew you were, you were fine. And he got like mad. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, what do you mean? You know, I was like, I just knew in my head you weren't there when those buildings went down. I just knew it. And, and, and um, I didn't know he was his whole company was gone. He was covering 26 engine that day and he had just gotten promoted and the captain who was covering his tour, Captain Frino, um, perished. And it was my husband's tour because he had taken off that day. So he had not taken off. They, this, the job is mutuals and you either do the first and second half and he was doing the second half. And, and uh, so he was the sole surviving officer in the company. And, um, and he didn't come home till the next day, but um, the rest of that day, he was at the firehouse and they went back at midnight and got the fire truck, which was buried. Um, the only one left was the chauffeur and um, they got it, which was probably the reason why he succumbed to throat cancer because he got into that cab with all that asbestos and it wasn't clean for months afterwards. They didn't come back and clean that cab for months. And uh, he drove around that cab, you know, daily, 26 engine, um, because it wasn't, it wasn't destroyed in the collapse, but it was never cleaned. So um, he had to take care of all the widows and everything. So basically, you know, he didn't get back to the next day, which is September 12th, he came off the bus, he took the bus home and I'm sitting on the stoop again, being outside with the kids, and he came off the bus, and his eyes were as pink as pink, the brightest pink you could see. The white of his eyes was so pink, and and he was just a zombie. Like he didn't had no, he just had no emotion. Like there was no emotion, and my neighbor came out, and he couldn't. He was having trouble breathing, and she gave him his her um, CPAP machine that she uses for her daughter's asthma. And he, she did a treatment with him and um, he showered, got dressed and he left and went back. And pretty much we were on our own for a month, at least, at least with, you know, three, four small children in a house with no kitchen, no, no floors. And, and, and you felt terrible, you know, you couldn't say anything because of what was going on, but, I finally went around to a neighbor in October and I, who was a, you know, a general contractor. And I said, I just sat on his couch and I cried and I said, I, I need help. Can you give me a sink? Something, anything, you know, I have three babies and I'm washing bottles in a, in a, in a tub. And he stopped the job he was doing. He came, he set up a makeshift kitchen for me so that we could at least function as a family. And, and then by, at that time, the, you, know, you got a picture of this little small house. We got our cabinets delivered. So not only do I have no kitchen, but I have boxes upon boxes of these tall cabinets and babies crawling on wood floors. It was, and you, you couldn't say anything because these guys were just going through so much. And it was, it was so horrible. And the kids, you, you tried not to watch the news, but that's all you did. And my, one of my twins, Robert, he would say to me, mommy, put on your show. I want to watch your show. And he was talking about the news. He wanted to watch like the 9-11 news. He got like so involved in it. And he was only three, not even four yet. But he wanted to watch the, mommy, put on your show. 
and you, you know, it, so you realize, oh my God, I'm watching too much of it. You know, I got to turn that off because the kids are starting to see it, you know, and so, I mean, that's it. That was our story. You know, it was nothing exciting, but it was, you know, I mean, we lost her school, lost several fathers, you know, very famous one, Timmy Stackpole, his children went to her school. Um, a lot of children whose parents worked there never came home. So it was, you know, in Marine Park was definitely affected. And uh, that's about it. I mean, it was, you never forget the smells, the smells that day that came. And if you look at the map of, you know, the satellite map of that day, you could see the, you could see the smoke it went right over Marine Park. You can see it goes right down to South Brooklyn. That's where the winds were going that day. And the smell, and I can't even imagine the smell that they smelt down there. So, I mean, it's, that's it. Kim, you were eight at the time? Yeah, I was eight. So my, my story is a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember being in school and the principal had said, we're not gonna go outside for recess today. And I remember thinking to myself, it's such a nice day out, why aren't we going outside? My teacher said, oh, they're doing construction outside and kids don't pay attention to that stuff. So we were all in our classroom and one by one, kids were just like leaving and nobody understood why. And you could tell the teacher was like crying, like her eyes were like red. I remember that, like her face was red and she looked like she was like, hiding something. So I'm not sure how the rumor started, but people were saying kids were getting pulled out for head lice. So I was actually happy that I was still in school because I, I didn't want head lice. Meanwhile, I, I, everybody in my class, I think there was probably, I think it was me and two other kids maybe left in the class, at least that I was sitting with at lunch when my mom um, came and got me. And I remember walking up the stairs and with the teacher and going to get my stuff. And I remember seeing my mom crying in the hallway and I'm like, mom, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm sorry. I have head lice. Like I had no idea. And then we went out to the car and uh, she explained everything that had happened to me and happened to my dad and like what was going on in the world. And I was just, I, I really don't remember how I interpreted it. I just remember like feeling a little sad. And um, we went home and I saw on the news, um, I guess it was left on. I, I saw them replaying the uh, plane going into the tower. And I remember my mom like shutting it off right away after I saw it. And I don't really think I thought much of it. I didn't think anything was gonna happen. like. When you're a kid, your thoughts are extremely different than when you're an adult. So I remember going out and playing with my friends and outside it was like black smoke everywhere. And I was like, what's going on? I, I remember the smell. Um, me and a bunch of kids were on the block playing and we were looking at the papers falling from the sky and we actually like made it a game to like go and collect them. And we were just like collecting them in the streets and there was this kid who lives uh, around the corner from me and he found like a check for like $5,000. And he thought he was like rich because we were kids and we had no idea this kid thought he had $5,000. Meanwhile, it was obviously a business check that had already been signed, but it was, it was like a, almost a full check, but it had like um, burnt edges. And I remember smelling the, like everything that we picked up and it smelled like a fire. So it was like pretty interesting. Um, I remember collecting them all and people were, were like, oh, I got more than you. Like it, it became a game. It was very strange to think about it now. Uh, I, I moved upstate when I was uh, 10. And I remember a lot of people talking about their experiences on 9-11. And they're, not that anyone's experience is better or worse than anybody's, but like they really truly didn't understand what happened that day. Like everyone was in their own little worlds of state like opposed to where I was it was like you were in it without actually being there so um it was it was definitely something I'll always remember even though it's a little bit it's not really a lot I mean I'm glad I don't remember everything 
but that's pretty much what I have. That's, that's pretty much it. I'm sorry. She went, she, she wouldn't let her dad leave for work. Um, several weeks. She was very upset because she knew he was going in, into Manhattan and it was very traumatic for her. She, she wouldn't let her father, um, she wouldn't let her father leave for work. And when he did leave for work, she was upset and she, um, did not have a very good teacher who was very empathetic. And, um, she would, ha she was having a lot of anxiety and trouble and they, um, she would write with like a Sharpie in her book, you know, incomplete. So my husband took like a giant black Sharpie and pretty much wrote F U on the, on the thing and sent it back. And, um, yeah, she really had a hard time. And then when we moved upstate, they, um, she had, part of the fifth grade is the nine 11 project. And they had no idea that she was in the classroom. So I went up and brought all this stuff that she had from her dad, including the papers. And she went up to present to her classroom and um, she couldn't present. She ran out of the room crying. And then I'm standing there with all the stuff. And the teacher said, I had no idea I had a student here that was affected. Like he just thought he had a bunch of upstate kids who, who really had no way, you know, and he was she a substitute teacher who it was like his like third day working. I felt so bad for him. And, and he, and, and here she had twisted glass from the world trade center. She had dust from the world trade center. She had papers. And now, so now Kim runs out of the class and every kid's eyes are like looking at me because now they're like, normally they not listening. Now they're all like listening. And I presented a project for her and uh, it was, yeah, it was, she was really affected by it. She doesn't remember, but it was very traumatic for her. Um, she was eight, you know, I mean, like they're, they're not, they're not babies, but they're not old enough to understand, but she knows her dad's going in there to the city every day and she knows fine and died. So she don't want him to go, you know, don't go, <laughs> don't go. I have to go. Well, you, you all don't, you know, and it was very hard for her. Patty, you've told me that you're, husband was really never the same after 9-11. No. Kim, did, did you notice that as an eight-year-old? What, what did you notice? Um, well, my dad had a good way of uh, camouflaging his feelings around his kids because I didn't really notice much of a difference other than the fact that he wasn't around as much in the sense of like he was always going to fireman events and I didn't notice that he was like sad, but I just figured, you know, it was because he was, he lost friends, but um, yeah, not that I can remember. And how soon did he get, start getting sick? Oh, he got sick. Uh, well, we found out about the cancer. It was a couple days after my 17th. Or 16. He was diagnosed on April 3rd. He died on May 2nd. Yeah, and they didn't tell me until the day after my birthday because I don't think they wanted to uh, make me sad on my birthday. But, but he it was pretty quick. He had curable cancer. So it was basically um, that he died um, from the results of the surgery. His body um, reacted by sending serous fluids to his lungs and gave him pneumonia because they removed two thirds of his one lung from the. Um, he had a intestinal tumor in his airway. You don't get intestinal tumors in your airway. He got one. So they removed two thirds of his lung and um, in the removal, his body reacted. The carcinoid tumor, your body sometimes feeds off carcinoid tumors. So when they removed it, um, it flooded with fluids and gave him pneumonia. And um, they had to put him on a respirator and then his organs started shutting down and his kidneys, and eventually his heart. So he had surgery on the 23rd and he died on May 2nd. I'm so sorry. The 9-11 yeah. the, the cancers are not your typical cancers. There are cancers no. on steroids and there are cancers that people had, the experts have never seen before. And I've talked to so many people at the first diagnosis, it's stage four. At the first symptom, it's stage four. It's horrifying right. and it's not ending. 
close to 20 no. years later, we're talking no. and. No, and in my mind, he, you know, he, because he was the sole surviving officer, he was down there a lot, but he was not, he was not able to, and because, because I had four children and I had to work, okay, I had to go to work. So he could not, he wasn't one of those guys who was down on the pile on, on every tour off. He couldn't be, I, we had to pay our mortgage. So I had to go to work. He had to be home with his kids. In my mind, it came from that cab. And then, and also they did lower him into the hole. Um, and with the, and then he was walking around the shops underneath. And um, so in my mind, that's when it happened in one of those two, cause he wasn't there other than that first day, which he was there that whole day, the first 48 hours. But afterwards, like you have so many guys that spent so much time there. He couldn't, he, he would have been, trust me, but we had to pay our bills and I had to go to work. So someone had to be home with our four children. So in my mind, it was from that cab that he, he went back and got his rig and he brought it back to 26 engine and it was not decontaminated for months. And his chauffeur is out on three quarters and he um, has severe World Trade Center cough, severe and severe issues. So I, I know for a fact that it was that cab they drove around in. So, and you know what? It, it, he, would, you, he would have never not done everything exactly the way he did it. So I, I don't, I, I can't, you know, this was his job and it's what he did and it's what he loved doing. And he would have gone, knowing everything that happened to him, he would do it, do it again because that's what he did.